Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad we are finally doing this. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of an honor because I, I do have a lot of respect for the work you all, you all do. And it's like, you seem all, always all together. And it's like, OK, I'm going to come and present here. Mm -hmm. Oops. <laughs> uh, and um, yes, we met in the context of the Siche initiative. And, and part of the things that uh, we brought up when participating in that as Collective of Flatlander, which is the name of our little uh, organization, we were bringing this notion of, uh, we were calling it first uh, multilingual strategies on how to, how to open spaces where different languages can be part of things. And then uh, later it evolved more into language justice, no? As a, as a way of pushing it forward. And it wasn't a thing that Colectivo or me invented. It has been a collective thing for years. Like the Highlander Center has been crucial in, in the Deep South in, in training people. And I was involved in that. But it, it, there's this woman called Alice Johnson who has done amazing work on really pushing organizations to think about what does it means to open spaces where languages, people who speak different languages, can relate to one another in a food of equality. And no, no language has advantage or superiority over other languages spoken in the room. No? And it takes a lot to try to create that kind of a space. And it really goes down, connected to the, a lot of the central principles of popular education and, in general, like social justice work. No? But connected to those principles of language justice or popular education is this central idea that uh, the, to do the work we do, as part of a larger movement for social racial justice, uh, we need to be rooted in uh, clear values, no? a vision of what do we want. And when you are part of the left, there is always this, well, I think the right also is very good at it. But in general, it's like sometimes our work can, can go up here, become way too ideological, and become all about the issues. And part of the work. I have been doing uh, sometimes is to to try to to integrate more like root root our work so that doesn't become like hot air, no. So in in popular education, one of the the way we talk about doing popular education is about opening the space for the conversation to happen. It's all about dialogue and the construction of power to change policies and situations. It's connected to the relationships and people working together. And that is rooted in dialogue. So language justice is essential to, for the dialogue to happen, but also popular education and the things you do to open that space for dialogue, for communities and people to exchange ideas and stories and all that. So the first thing we usually do in any kind of workshop or meeting is like, let's try to slow down, stop the rhythm we live in, and open a, a space where the whole person can come in. So that it's not just about the issues. And there's a lot of pressure in, a, in the dominant political culture where we operate. In the, even in the social justice movement happens a lot. It's all about the issues. It's all about winning. It's all about the campaign. And sometimes, sadly, it's also all about the short-term deliverables uh, and grant cycles or campaign cycles or, or electoral cycles. And then we can get lost in that and forget what, is, what it is about in the long term. And then forget not only in terms of the people we work with, but even for us, you know, as if we're fighting somebody else's fight. So I'm going to do it here, because uh, this is also the idea for this to also be a dialogue. No? So this is an exercise that's really like key to my toolbox. Uh, <laughs> to try to make that connection of how what we do is personal, no? and that we do it from who we are and who also from who we are not. And if you can take or ask one of these, please. Okay. So you take one of these, let's see if I do it right, sheet of paper. <laughs> It's a dangerous word for me from now, but if I say it wrong, it sounds rude. Take one of this. No. <laughs> and one of the markers. Thank you. And just write your name in the center of the page. We're going to use the letters of our name to write words that answer a question. 
See? And you can use the, the letter at the, at the beginning, at the end, in the middle of the world, and you, uh, and you can use creative grammar, and you can use whatever language you, you want. Uh, so the question is, why do you do this work? No? Like, um, we're doing work that goes against the flow, no? and uh, you get called names, and sometimes you pay prices for doing it. And so why do you do this, this work of denouncing and or getting against all this stuff? Why? No? And then use the letters of your name to write words that speak to that. And if there is a word, a letter that you just can not know what to do with it, it's okay to leave it blank. And we are going to take two hours. No, we're going to take <laughs> <laughs> two minutes. And if you finish and your neighbor finish, you can just show quickly what you got. Okay, Gloria. Okay. So we are in the in the fast track version of this exercise. Uh, you can take this exercise and like take a, an hour. <laughs> to, to do it, and, and I have made it with 100 people in a humongous room. And you, it, it's amazing when you have a group that you're like they're, they're together for the first time, and this is a way to get people to, to get to talk to one another and make personal connections and also have a chance to share their own meanings. Everybody has meanings to share and stories and stuff, and like that kind of equalizes the room, no? Um, and uh, so the way I do it usually, like you do that, and you ask people to walk around, move around the room, and uh, usually we have them to tape it to themselves as a name tag. And so you have to go to read the other, which is a lot of what we do in our work. Go and read the other, and you can only read the other if you expose yourself. No, if you get out of your comfortable zone, which is where learning happens. So there's a lot of other stuff that you can start taking out of it. But, uh, then, because it's usually very big groups, if it's a small group and you have time, you can actually take the time to have everyone explain each one of the words and one, and even get into the story. And uh, if it's a larger group, you just ask people to, sh to share one word that is especially uh, important for them today, which is what we're going to do right now. I'm going to ask you to say your name and what is your word today from the ones that you have in your, in your name. Briefly, we can go around and I can say I'm, I'm uh, Pancho, and uh, my word today will be privilegio, which means privilege. No? Why do I do the work with the question we were asking? Why do you do this work? Well, for, it's, it's a privilege. I, can, I do it because I can. There's a lot of other people who would like to be doing this work, and they can't. So. Lovely, Pancho. Thank you. My name is Susan, and my word is us. So I was having a hard time thinking of a you word, but then I thought us and them, and I wrote us and us. So it's all, it's all us. Uh, so my word was actually, um, my name is Pamela. My word is actually Francis, and Francis is my daughter's name. And uh, Francis, um, my child and everybody else's children are, I think, the reason that I want to do work that has kind of a lasting impact and makes the world that she lives in a better one than the one I grew up in, one that's more equitable and just, and, uh, and uh, has more opportunities. Um. My name is Andrew, and I have a privilege in English. Um, it was something I was also thinking about, and uh, something that Pamela and I have talked about in terms of our work with, with CJ is the more we get to meet people from around the country, from outside the US who do this work, uh, we've gone through a process of learning. That process is not over, obviously, and it's a reminder of all of the times in which we are privileged 
we get to do this work, we get paid to do it, um, we get health care to do it, you know, we get a lot of privileges even by doing this work. And so just to keep that as, as conscious as possible. I'm Fernando, and it's days like today, I realize I have too many letters in my <laughs> Yeah, that's why I gave the hand that you could use Nando or, or something. Um, and I think I like my all my words, but I'll pick representation. And I picked that word because I feel that I represent um, so many things: my my culture, my region, the Central Valley. Um, my gender, my, I, I just feel privileged to represent all of those things. Mm -hmm. Mine was posibilidades, which is possibilities in English, saying this, A. <laughs> <laughs> And just thinking about um, kind of what came up was just the part of why I do the work is just having that vision of what are, what are, what could be the possibilities if we did live in a healthier world and a more equitable and just world. Cool. Um, my name's Yvonne, and I, my word will be invent, mm -hmm. and um, because um, I feel like I am lucky that I. Am able to whether in my home life, family life, friends life, to invent and work life to invent new styles as they come. Whether my organizing, organizing myself or helping others to organize themselves, um, and I do have that opportunity to just invent new um, styles in that way, and it's and work with new people and actually strive to work with different people and try to understand people's um, styles and, and um, yeah, I think it's something all of to admit. <laughs> Thank you all. Well, are you all ready to go? I'm oh, sorry, no. No, go, 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 okay. go, go, sorry. Thank um, you. The question was why do we do this work? So um, my name is Lori and um, my word is ojos because if you have your eyes open, how can you not want to respond to the world we live in? Thank you. Sorry about it. No. So why we do the work we do because of privilege, because of us, because of Francis, because of more privilege, <laughs> representation, possibilities, invent, and ojos. And, uh, I put it in the center because a lot of times, again, like we do our work and we have our values, principles, visions, and needs, and why, like why we do it. And a lot of times, there's so much pressure on how to do it well and when, and all, all those other questions. Then the why and what for gets left behind, and we start getting lost and moving around other other people's centers of gravity instead of our own centers of gravity. You know. We like doing it like doing it as a spiral because also when you bring a group together, you're doing collective work. I mean, work for justice is always collective. Nobody does it like individually. So it's a dialogue and it's like this circular space, but also it's always changing. So it's, it's not a closed circle, it's a spiral. And, uh, and it's rooted in our stories on who we are. It's personal and the work is, has to start from who we are. It has to have that personal collection. It cannot end at that personal level because it becomes in this individualistic kind of, can become this like, just like ideal little happy world that outside doesn't exist. No, so it cannot just end on that personal level. But it had to be rooted there and then become collective and going into the community. And it's a challenge to get that that uh, that balance and that being rooted on because the truth is yes there is there is pressure to deliver no there are deliverables and there are and there are deadlines that you learn that they're not really dead they're zombie lines really like <laughs> zombie lines because they're dead but they keep moving so <laughs> I think we should call them zombie lines. <laughs> What is the zombie line for that report? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I 
I put privilege, I usually put like, with, like something with, with hope or people or community, but uh, I have been especially aware of privilege lately. I, I have been working the past few months and I'm working more like, uh, I made a transition from Colectivo now to be working more kind of full-time or part-time with a group of immigrants in Houston called the Living Hope Wheelchair Association. And it's a group of migrants who had spinal cord injuries. They were involved in workplace accidents or crime or, or car accidents, and they broke their spine. No? And seven years ago, the, the Harris County Hospital District, in the largest medical center of the world, decided to cut any help to, to them because they didn't qualify for Medicaid, they didn't have papers, most of the members of the group. So they stopped giving them basic supplies like diapers or catheters or the stuff they need for everyday life, no? And because that was the legal thing to do. Um, and they, what, what they were they, what were they gonna do? Like just what, like okay, I'm not gonna use anything or what? So they organized. They started getting together, organized, started selling stuff in the streets or doing raffles in churches, and uh, going to rodeos like jaripeos. You know, jaripeos is like Mexican rodeos, mm -hmm. and uh, and put together sort of resources, buy supplies, work with, with distributors, and started to get like this network to get supplies and distribute them and share them, no? There was really never enough for the needs, like a catheter you need to use one a day, and because they didn't have enough, they had to reuse them and boil them, they learned how to do, they got some training, but still like the rate of infection is a lot higher. And this was seven years ago, and from then, they then become like, became like a little 501c3. They are their own board and their own staff, although they don't really get paid. So it's a very unique organization of, of a group of people who really like marginalized at so many levels. No, they are people with disabilities. They are low wage workers. They are people of color, Latino, Mexican immigrants living in Texas, and they are most of them undocumented. And that has not stopped them. And they, they um, gave me the. They asked me to be there. I was like a volunteer with them. Me and my wife have been working with them for years, and, and uh, so they went, "Oh, why, why you, don't you don't you want to be our director?" Okay, so <laughs> right now I'm the acting director. Although we need to figure out what does that means, and, and we have no money. So, <laughs> but uh, it, working we're working on the disability justice world is new for me. No. And I have been, I mean, I have been doing this, this, this year in, in September is going to be 30 years that I started because I started in kindergarten. No, <laughs> I, I started right off high school. I went to Chiapas as a, as a rural teacher for a year. And since then, I always have been involved in work with Guatemalan refugees or in Nicaragua or rural communities. And the last almost 15 years here in the U.S. with immigrant rights groups, and it has been a big learning experience also to learn about all these different movements for justice and even the amazing history of resistance that the U.S. has. No? That when you grow up in the Latin American left, you are embedded in struggles there that are really intense. And, but the knowledge we have about the level of resistance in the U.S., is, is, we don't know enough about it. No? We don't know about the Chicano movement. And, and we know about the civil rights movement, but it's sometimes it's very general. Thing, but, but, but it has been really amazing to see, yes, the U.S. is the empire. The U.S. has, as, as empire, has created so much dead and suffering in Latin America and our countries. And, but then at the same time, like, there is this amazing history of people always resisting that empire within the empire, no? Anyway, I, I have had a chance to learn about, like, my privilege as a heterosexual male, documented, middle class, all that time to reflect. But now it really like more into this, working with this group of my colleagues who sit there in their wheelchairs and trying to do as much as they can, living every day in pain uh, and, uh, and the, the, the challenges for mobility and communication and stuff is just like humbling. And it's a big, big check for me, like in terms of my, my privileges as an able person. Uh, and learning the language, and but also really see what does it mean to the way I go about my work, and 
and really a, a refresher of something I said in, I think in that presentation in Detroit about community engagement. What, what does it mean, community engagement, like to get the community to participate in our things and all that. And we were talking about how we need to think about privilege. That is essentially we as an organization want to engage with a community. First, we, is not, we want them to engage with us. We want to engage with them and accompany them in their struggle for survival and for justice. It's not about us. It's about how we can uh, be an ally how we can support that and not necessarily how can make you come to my event. That's not engagement. I mean, it's an invitation, but if we're talking engagement, I want to see a ring and then we marry. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about this and, and, and that presentation, one of the things that came up with is like, privilege in some way can be defined as the, the things you can forget about. Tell me what you can forget about and I can tell you what are some of the privileges you have. And I apply that to me, and, and with this group, it's very clear. Like, if I can forget about a ramp for accessibility, that means I don't need it. If I can forget what is the last time that the bus runs in that route, it's because I don't need the bus, I have my car. If I can forget about interpretation, it means because I can function in a bilingual uh, world. And on and on and on. If I can forget about security in terms of can I work out at night and stuff, is no, I can forget about the risk of sexual violence and stuff. Like I'm a male. If I can forget about, can we do this? There was this group that wanted to have an immigrant rights conference right in the border in El Paso. And they were, I mean, we want the people from the community to come. Well, they might come, but they won't be able to, re to come back to their town because the migra is there and they won't be able to go back. No, if I can forget about checkpoints and immigration, it's because I have papers. And it's hard, and the thing is how to be aware and open and really like be aware of all that stuff without turning into a guilt trip because guilt paralyzes guilt turns into actually guilt turns into anger against those who make me feel guilty but then the, there is this notion of solidarity and love and, and responsibility that can 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 be more helpful no so working with living hope <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, it has been a whole other, uh, it's adding all this. I mean, I have been working with them for years, but now it's like more like responsibility to, to do more things happen, but uh, has been bringing more this connection or question about privilege and the role as an ally and the responsibilities. And then going back to the question of, okay, community engagement, like now there are groups that want to have uh, Living Hope to be part of, represent the community and be engaged. But then it's always a question, okay, but how is that a two-way road and what are the political implications? How do you do that from a value-centered perspective? Not just at the liberables, short term, it has to good, look good in my report perspective, which is really something that weighs heavily in the, in the nonprofit industrial complex, no? and really takes away a lot of the flavor and the reason on why we do things, and ends working against us in the long term. So what, how can we do those engagement in ways that really help build power for the long run? And uh, I don't have a recipe on how you do it. Uh, one thing I, I shared with some groups in asking why do, do you this work, and I shared that image of a picture I took in the Mexico-Guatemala border. Me and my wife on, on summer, we go to the Mexico-Guatemala border and visit the shelters, uh, the immigrant shelters that work with Central American migrants that are crossing Mexico. She does research on human rights and I do the connections with the shelters and just be there and we take our kids. And, uh, and it has been also, uh, I don't, I mean, this day the word that comes to my mind is brutal experience because it's, it's, uh, it's very humanizing in terms of, it's humbling but it just breaks your heart too. And sometimes it just can be overwhelming in terms of what are we doing and how can we uh, confront that. This is a picture of the Central American migrants getting ready. They're, they're already jumping on, the, on top of the train that is now called the Beast. And they cannot travel in buses across Mexico because there's checkpoints. Mexico after NAFTA became a vertical border. It was part, it was part of the agreement. So Mexico enforces immigration for the US trying to stop the flow of Central American migrants get, trying to get here. 
and you know being expelled because of the globalized economy and the aftermath of the wars and and the same forces that are trying to make it hard for them to come and the same forces that exploit them here were the ones that caused the the, the exit. No, we have interviewed people there who were making sixty dollars a week in a sweatshop that was making Hanes underwear, no, or 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 uh, jeans that are sold here. So how are you going to raise your family on sixty dollars a week in a post-war economy in El Salvador? No? So they they and this guy actually we interview him in a shelter for people who fall from the train and get amputated by the train. No, so this young twenty-something-year-old guy had lost his leg and uh, was working there at the shelter actually helping to build the shelter, building a new, a new room for those who will come afterwards. Um, so you face that and you, you see the train and see the people who get there and might make it here or not. A lot of them make it, some of them don't, and the price is really high. But I try to keep this in mind because when we invite people in the community, in the immigrant, I work a lot with immigrant communities, but when you invite someone in the community to come to, to, come to our event, we're gonna have a conversation. And we don't know, I mean, it's, and it's okay, people don't know. But the thing is, we're inviting into the room some, some people that has been through this or, or different versions of this. How we honor that? No, we, we bring them in and then we talk to them about the issues and just rain on them all the issues and all the information. How, how can they be, that be really helpful and, and respectful in the long run in terms of building a power that can transform these kind of structures? That doesn't mean we don't need to know the issues and we don't need to have the, that information and that knowledge are very important, but the thing is how we can get processes and, and spaces where we can have a dialogue between those, the information, the knowledge, but also the wisdom that comes from suffering through that and surviving and still being able to come to a meeting after all that crap happens to you and you survive. That the kind of strength and power and wisdom you are bringing into the room, how can we open a space where that wisdom can have a place in the room and get in dialogue with our skills and connect and whatever, and then we make something happen. It's a, it's a different time frame that the legislative session or the campaign session or the grant timeline. They can, those, those other pieces can be weaved into a longer term thing. But I think it's a central question of how we be open to know what story is there behind the Vietnam refugee or the Chinese refugee or the Filipino woman or the African American person that is coming and is coming from, like having their family migrated maybe from the deep south to the west coast in terms of, of the Jim Crow and the repression there, and then being here and having to face the system here, and how, what are the stories there, or the Chican or the Native American. But a lot of time we don't make the time to open some space for that kind of power to come out. And, and, and it's our loss because that's the power that in the long run can actually transform yes. this other kind of power. We're not gonna defeat the power that is oppressing us using the same power that, that same kind of power. They're really good at it. We're not going to, and if we get as good as them, then we lost. And that, that picture of the train with the workers traveling out, hanging outside, for me, is the image of the victory, the final victory of global capitalism. You know, the commodities are traveling inside really safe, and the workers are traveling hanging outside. I mean, as a, as a, as a global capital, it doesn't get better than that. No, like cost really low, and then those who make it, you get to have them as a pool of workers to then really like, you make them undocumented, you make them illegal, you illegalize them and criminalize them, and you make money out of exploiting them and work, and then you make money out of incarcerating them, no, with the private prisons. It's an amazing business. So it's, it's really, it's really like diabolical, no? And then it's also amazing that people keep resisting and they still can keep going. So part of the reflection is that the, the, 
there is this experience of our communities walking through suffering and hope and I think we all can connect to that at the personal level and that's why we try to make this personal connection because we all have had personal experience of suffering and hope. And, it, and then it's personal, the struggle is personal. We all have been through stuff. And actually what gives us hope is a memory that we went through stuff and we made it. Hope is not a function of imagining a rosy future. Hope is a function of memory. You remember that you went through something really tough. And because you remember that you made it through and you remember your community that helped you to make it through and the, the, the strength, the power that helped you, then you can have hope. And those who have been through a lot, have a lot to teach. That doesn't mean, like, okay, now the burden is on them, no? like another task, <laughs> no? But it's like, be open. Like, how can we be open to that when, if it comes out, no? So this in interconnection and, the, and an ideal graphic that I'm still learning how you do is like they wouldn't really contain, like, like include one another perfectly. There will be pieces of each circle that will be out of the other because your family cannot include all of who you are. Right. No, the same way in that the community cannot include sometimes all of who your family and you are and, and the society and structure. But the idea is to see how there is, when we are working on social issues, it, it could go both ways. If you're working in a larger social issue, we need to ask how this really relates to the communities, the families and the persons. No, but in the other way is also if you are if you are a service provider, and you say, oh, we're gonna solve whatever issue one person at a time. I personally hate that expression because it's like, okay, get in line, and it might be years and decades, or or you might not make it, and it just like reduces things to this individual thing that is really very efficient to hide the real reason, the structural and historical structure. Uh, um, causes of what we're facing, no? Uh, so that is a, a diagram that we use in trainings to try to make those connections between the personal level, the family, the community, and the society. And then this other uh, uh, diagram that we have been using is like the iceberg, you know, you also Titanic. So we all know about icebergs. <laughs> You want to sing Celine Dion song? No? OK, we're good. OK, please go. <laughs> so what we see of the issues is like 12% of, I mean, it's the iceberg only shows you 12% of it. And the way society, and you're really good at this here at, at BMC in communications and analyzing public opinion and all here, is like how there's this superficial analysis of issues, and the debate stays there, and it's very convenient. And so those issues are reduced to problems. And then there is a lot of services that respond sometimes is campaigns and services used to help people stay afloat, which is very valuable. I have a lot of respect for social service providers because I see the difference they make in people's lives. It's important. It's sad that there has to be such a huge nonprofit and community organization services doing stuff that the state should be doing, that the government should be doing, or that it wouldn't be necessary if people will get decent paying wages. So it's like the nonprofit sector and the community organizations are actually subsidizing and catching and resolving the failures of big corporations in, in the economic system and the way that government has been ridiculously reduced, no? So we, we address the issues, helping people stay afloat. When we go deeper, we see that those issues are created by policies, no? That you get people who are, don't get healthcare and then there is the need for the clinic because there are policies that exclude them from that, no? Or you get people who don't, do you need the food bank because there is wage or and minimum wage and there's no living, living wages and the, all these all these uh, services are needed because there are policies that create them. So to address the policies we do campaign, we make waves. We do this campaign, we write our senator and we call and we try to move the decision makers until we win a policy. But uh, there's so far you can go with that and, and it's getting worse and worse to realize like, I mean like the so-called debate on immigration reform is like really depressing. The policies they're coming with and then they have this drama, this theater saying like, the two parties are so far, far away that they cannot collaborate and you see they're really on the same page and a lot of their, their central elements to understand and think immigration reform 
are really rooted in a regime of apartheid, on having a legal framework that creates a whole sector of society that is defined as less than a citizen, and then has less right. And, and you can only define someone as less as a citizen if there is a part of you that really has this, uh, maybe you are three-fifths of a human. No? Or like the Spaniards asked when they met with the indigenous, are they really human or not? Like, do they have a soul? Can we evangelize them or can we just enslave them? It seems like a very old debate. So that when you, you have to go deeper and think on the structures. What are some long-term structures that are really creating some of these policies that are creating these problems? And you find these structures in terms of white supremacy and capitalism and colonialism you know, and a lot of those other isms, no? Sexism, heterosexism, ableism. And then, then so what? No, okay, what can we do? It's overwhelming. We're just gonna walk out of here depressed. Now the thing is you can think that there is a lot of cases in history in there there has been social movements that change the tide. It's not just a long a shorter campaign to change a policy. It's actually a movement that changes the tide, that really shakes the structures and, and makes a, a quantum leap, a quality transformation of the relations in society, you know, like the civil rights movement, or the way it has been happening in different parts of the world. And it happens sometimes get stuck, like the Arab Spring. You know, suddenly there were these big jumps, and now it's like these forces like pushing back, and it's not over. Sometimes it gets incredibly bloody, and, and it's connected to these colonial structures. But sometimes suddenly you all get surprised, like in South, in South America right now, you have a couple of places where a scenarios that were defined as impossible and anyone who will have dared to suggest that Evo Morales one day will be president of Bolivia will have been considered by the policy experts uh, naive or stupid or whatever. And the fact is that that indigenous man who at some point as an organizer of coca workers was beaten up to a pulp, they didn't kill him because they, they thought he was dead. And he, he didn't die, and then his friends helped him, and he's back, and now he's the president of Bolivia, and he's doing things that people think that are like, no, how you are nationalizing this industry and this other industry? Like, that's communist, like, you're crazy. No, you have this old man, uh, um, I always block his name, and the, the sweet old guy who's the president of Uruguay. Um, well, I, it will come back to me. Yeah. Yes, well, the thing is, this guy was in, in a dungeon for 12 years during the military dictatorship. No? 12 years he suffered torture and all kind of stuff. And now he's the president of Uruguay. He lives in a working class barrio in this tiny house. He goes to work in a despachado motoneta with the. He cut his salary like radically and, and he's reverting years of neoliberal economy doctrines to try to equalize. Or the president of Brazil, I mean, there are critiques. Of course, there will be always critiques and a lot of them valid that it's not radical enough. It's walking away, it's negotiating. It's, but the thing is, you have a woman who was also a, a, a prisoner and was tortured and abused and raped and survived and is the president of, of the sixth largest economy in the world. So I think that our work is not impossible, it's improbable. But we exist because, I mean, we are an improbability. As humans, our planet is an improbability. And, and I guess the, the challenge is how we work balancing the need to respond and deliver in the short term and be effective and accountable and efficient with the money we raise on behalf of the people. And we're good, and then all, we will even enjoy it because it's a passion, it's a vocation. Like when you're doing something, it's like you need to enjoy it. It's a, you have the chance to work on something you love, like, okay, yes, yeah, go for it. How we can do that, be good at it, and at the same time keep the eyes on the long term in the price and be an intentional ally for, for with people in the very close circle, but also in the larger scheme of things that, that are engaged not on debates but on battles. No? When we were working, writing this uh, toolkit for just, uh, language justice that is going to come out in soon, I hope. But uh, 
I was reading about the debate about bilingual education and if English should be the only language in the U.S. and all this. And, and suddenly I, I read some of the arguments of the English only people and then I read some of the stories of people fighting for the right to speak their own language that was literally beaten out of them for the Chicanos and the Mexican Americans in the U.S., in Texas, in Cali. They were, the Spanish was beaten out of them in school, physically. If you're speaking Spanish, bang. No? So these languages are right that, I mean, and what is more personal than your language? Only your body. How aggressive is that, no? So I realized like the price that people pay for not being, being able to speak their language is connected to your life, to your quality of life, your dignity, and sometimes your life, no? You are being, I mean, you cannot explain yourself to the doctor and suddenly you don't get the attention and you die or like, or the, the instructions of some work and you end dying in an accident. So it's, it's a matter of life and death, uh, death in many cases. And it was really clear for me that what for many in a positions of privilege and power, what, many things that for them are issues for debate, for our communities are battles of life and death. And again, like we are engaged on the debate and you work on communications and, and producing ideology and analyzing and messaging and all this, that's part of the debate. How we can we do that honoring the fact that we're talking about these battles of of life and death, and do it in a way that is still effective, that actually doesn't shut down the people we want to reach, the audiences we want to reach, that have this incredible resistance to to look at these at these issues. No, like I don't have the answer. I think one experience I had is that more than convincing people. Because I was going, we started a worker center in Houston, and we're going to open for comments and questions in two minutes. But uh, we we were uh, we started a worker center in Houston, like how old is my girl? Six years? Six years ago, and uh, one of my jobs was to do interfaith organizing. I, I had to go talk to the churches on why they should be supporting low wage workers and immigrant rights, and and this is Houston, the capital of the mega churches. Uh, so a lot of times I found myself speaking in front of an audience where 90, 98% of the people were white and 80% were older than 60 something. And I made a mistake a couple of times of trying to come with my convincing ideology, whatever, and didn't go too well. Uh, and then I realized like it's personal, it's, these are my elders. So they, they, they actually know more about life than I do. And I'm in their church. So I mean, I'm literally housed under the value house. So I'm not, they, need, they need to come to their own conclusions. And instead of trying to convince them, I just was like, OK, I'm going to tell you some stories of what are we facing as communities, what the workers are facing, what I have seen. And then you, because in Spanish we will say, just tan grandecitos, no, you're, you're old enough <laughs> to know, you. no, and because I respect you, you are my other, I'm not going to tell you what's what, you are actually supposed to give me guidance on how to go about the world, you are my elders. I'm not going to tell you what to do with that. You we are in your church, your, your doctrine tells you stuff, you, you are old, so I'm going to tell you about how hard it is to be a low-wage immigrant worker and have your wages stolen again and again and not being able, or how hard it is, like some of the stories on what happens when you don't have a medical insurance and you get in an accident and you're living in the only state in the U.S. where workers' comp is not mandatory. So, and then it started to work. You will see the, like the openness, no? And of course there was always people who, they weren't listening, they just were waiting for their chance to say like, why they don't come here with papers? Why don't they stay in their country? Why don't their countries uh, take care and do what they need to do, no? But then by that moment, I, I was just like, okay, what do the group thinks about that? And then they will take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that has made any sense, but some of the tips sometimes in doing this work either in groups or stuff it's like one is the popular education is this methodology or but this is also an educational philosophy an approach to learning and teaching that is rooted in dialogue and people's experience 
and the notion that all people are experts on their own experience so that you shouldn't have like the experts and the learners but like you are going to be rooted in experience everybody has something to, to share and it's a, a, an idea of dialogue participation with passion <laughs> and then you try to open a space for trust and collective action no I never I don't like using a safe space because privilege is a bitch <laughs> and it really what feel safe for me with all the privilege I carry my feel my feel incredibly unsafe for someone else so I don't I don't like, believe in that notion like we're creating a safe space where maybe it might be safe for me maybe we or it's a, it's, a, it's a good intention it's a good intention but it's harder to do than to maybe we can create a safer space than outside then culture and spirituality in my experience also like that route to what makes people strong to go through all this no and also it's connected to a vision beyond the issues not just like to do the, what we need to do because it's the right thing to do. It helped the multilingual spaces, language justice, our more effective tool to create democratic spaces. It requires a big investment and commitment and long-term uh, process. And then in, in spaces like here in the Bay Area, but now it happens everywhere, like suddenly in, in your one zip code you can have 50 different languages. It becomes a super complex challenge but we like challenges so you can and then you start with what you can you can start by trying to open a bilingual space and then you move from there and humor I don't really believe in humor anymore <laughs> I'm, I'm really jaded now <laughs> no this this last round of immigration reform did it <laughs> well thank you so much thank for you. coming and sharing thank you. with us thank you. Thank you.